Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young girl has been found in a cheap hotel room, apparently an attempted suicide. There's reason to suspect foul play. Your job, investigate. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 19th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. We'd just gotten a call from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the second floor, the treatment room. Yes? Would you like to see Dr. Hall, please? Come in, Joe. Joe, Frank? Hi, Hi. Doc. This the girl? Yeah. How's she doing? Well, not sure yet. Just finished the transfusion. And when are you going to know? We think she's going to live, but there's no way of telling right now how much damage has been done to the brain tissue. Mm-hmm. Bad bruise on her face. Must have received a bad blow. Might have gotten it when she fell. Mm-hmm. Let's go outside, huh? I can use the smoke. Okay. Well, if there's any change, I'll be out in the hall. All right, Doctor. You got a cigarette? I'm fresh out. Yeah, here you are. Frank? Yeah, thanks. Here's a match. <sighs> thanks. I didn't know you gave transfusions in cases like this, Doc. I don't have to very often. You see, a thing like this, the carbon monoxide in the gas joins with the hemoglobin in the red cells. won't let go. Blood takes the monoxide through the system and suffocates the brain tissue. We've given her some coramine, helps speed up the heart action. The way it looks, she's got a good chance of living, but we won't know how bad it really is until later. It's a rough one, isn't it? You find out who she is? Well, according to the stuff we found in her wallet, her name's Mona Fenton. Another thing that doesn't make much sense, Doc, she registered into the hotel as Mrs. John Norris. Near as we can find out, she wasn't married. How'd you come up with that? Well, when the office got word about it, we tried to get in touch with her husband. We called the phone number on the ID that we found in her wallet, talked with her mother. She says a girl's single. Well, how about the guy she was with? You been able to talk to him? No, nope. haven't found out who he is. Name doesn't check out, huh? Not that we can find. How about the mother? She give you anything? Well, we just talked to her for a minute. We're going over there when we leave here. Maybe she can come up with some answers. I sure hope so. A couple of more questions you can ask her. Yeah? What's that? Find out if the girl's been under a doctor's care. Well, what do you mean? Checked her over when she came in. Found marks. On her arms? Yeah. I think she's an addict. <laughs> At 8.30 a.m. that morning, a guest in a small hotel on Grand Avenue had thought that he detected the odor of gas in the halls of the building. He notified the desk clerk, and together they conducted a search of the premises. Finally, they ascertained that the escaping gas was coming from a room on the third floor of the hotel. When the desk clerk got no answer to his calls, he used a pass key to open the door. Sprawled across the bed was a girl who appeared to be in her early 20s. The gas heater in the room had been turned on full and the windows were closed, locked and stuffed with pieces of torn sheets to keep the fumes in the room. The quick action of the desk clerk had undoubtedly saved the girl's life. While the hotel guest called an ambulance, the clerk turned off the gas, opened the windows and administered artificial respiration to the girl until the ambulance crew arrived. As an attempted suicide, the homicide detail had to make an investigation and Frank and I were assigned to the case. After we talked to Doc Hall at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, we drove down to the hotel where the girl had been found. Right in here. Anybody been in this room since the other officers left? No, sir. They told me to lock it until you could see it. All right, sir. 
Well, this is just the way you found it, is that right? Well, yes, of course. The gas is turned off and I open the windows, but uh, everything else is the same. I see. Well, from what you said on the phone, she came in last night, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, at least that's what the registration book says. They checked in at uh, 10.15. Did you take care of them? No, I was out to dinner when they got here. Who checked them in? Jeff, Jeff Christensen. Is he around? No, not right now. He'll probably be back tonight. You know where we can find him? Well, I don't know. See, Jeff got paid last night. Got his week's wages. Last I saw him, he was on his way out on the town with some of his friends. Jeff goes out on the town. Maybe we don't see him in a couple of days. I see. But you figure he'll be back tonight, huh? Oh, yes, yes. Jeff only worked a couple of days last week, so he ain't gonna go on much of the town. Mm-hmm. Did you see the man Miss Fenton came in with? No, I didn't. They were already in the room when I got back from dinner. I uh, checked the book. I got the money from Jeff before I left. The man must have gone out sometime early this morning. I guess I was asleep. My room's just back of the desk. The fellow must have got out while I was asleep. I see. Did you get any calls from the room at all? Not a one. Like I told those uniformed officers we hear, I didn't see them at all. Not a peep. As a matter of fact, I was thinking how nice and quiet they were. But, but the way the room looks, they sure must have had some sort of argument. Yes, sir. Huh. Would you know if they brought any baggage with them? Matter of fact, I know they didn't. Sure looks like they did some heavy drinking, don't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Glasses. That bottle's almost empty. Yeah. I'd rather you wouldn't touch the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I won't. Say, uh, you talked to the girls' people yet? No, sir, we haven't. But you plan to see them, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. You, you know when you see a people... Yes, sir. What's that? Well, I, I don't much mind the dirty glasses and having to straighten the room up. That's all part of the hotel business. But I wish you'd say something about the torn sheets. Tell the people about them. I don't want to cause no trouble, but maybe if they know how about the sheets were all torn up, they'd want to make good on them. You will mention them, won't you? Hmm? Yes, sir. I'll call the office, Joe. Have them send out a crew, see what prints we can lift. All right, fine. Who else has a pass key to this room? Oh, you mean beside me? Yes, sir. Well, ain't nobody. Where's the key kept? It hangs on a nail next to the desk. That big nail there, it hangs right on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when you came into the room, did you notice if there was anything around the door to keep the gas inside? Uh, I don't follow you. Well, you found pieces of torn sheets around the windows, you say. Now, was there anything like that but the door? Oh, oh, yes, I'm with you now, yeah. Now, let me think. As I remember, no, no, there wasn't nothing there, just around the windows. Mm-hmm. Was the key in the lock when you came up here? You mean inside the room? Yes, sir, that's right. No, no. The reason I know that for sure is that I looked through the keyhole. Tried to see what was in the room. No, sir, the key wasn't in. Of course, <laughs> that don't mean nothing. Sir? Well, only a couple of the rooms have keys anyway. We don't use them anymore. You mean you don't lock the doors? Sure, we lock the doors. We got them all locked all the time. This is a respectable hotel. Of course we lock the doors. But not with those keys. We got those other locks on the doors. Oh, I see. You see, yeah, see that? Sort of like Yale locks? That kind, you know. That's uh, what locks the doors, not the other keys. Yes, I see. Of course we lock the doors. Yes, sir. The locks catch when the door is closed, though, is that right? Yep, locks them tight. I got in touch with Lee Jones, Joe. He sent a crew right over. Good. I checked with Doc Hall. How's the girl? Oh, she's coming along. Doc says she's doing better. Oh, these fellows that you're going to have roaming around here. What's this all about? Is something wrong? We're not sure yet, sir. Oh, dear, dear. It always happens like this, don't it? What's that, sir? I try to run a respectable place. Goodness knows I do. I keep it right up to date. It's good service, and something like this happens. There was no reason for that girl to do a thing like this. Not in my hotel. Now you cops come in here. Cops going to be all over the place. Tenants aren't going to like it. They ain't going to like it at all. Just because of that girl. Why'd she have to come in here and do a thing like this? Why'd she have to do it at all, sir? Eleven twenty-six a.m. We questioned the people in the hotel. None of them could remember hearing any undue noise coming from the room where the girl had tried to kill herself. Normally, the investigation would have been routine, but with the possibility of foul play, we had to check every angle and then check it again. The crew from the crime lab arrived and went over the room. Under the bed, they found an empty capsule, the type commonly used to dispense heroin. They also came up with a clean set of fingerprints on both glasses. They were photographed and the water glasses themselves were removed to the crime lab to be booked as evidence. The registration card the couple had signed was turned over to Don Meyer in handwriting. 
The name was checked through our record bureau, through the phone book, and through the city directory, but when the leads were checked out, we were no further in knowing who the man was who'd taken the room with Mona Fenton. Word was left at the hotel for the handyman to contact us as soon as he returned. Word was also left that if the man who'd registered with the Fenton girl returned, we were to be called. 11.45 a.m., the men from the crime lab finished their investigation and returned to the office to compile the results. Frank and I left the hotel and drove out to the address listed on the girl's identification. It was a large white colonial home near one of the colleges. We rang the doorbell and waited. Yes? Mrs. Fenton? Yes, that's right. What is it you want? Police officers would like to talk to you. Oh, come in. Thank you. It's about Mona, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I right. knew something like this would happen. I knew it all along. Beg your pardon? When she first had this crazy idea, when she first told me about it, I knew. Kids, try to tell them. Just try, and they tell you that times have changed. They say that you're not keeping up with the time. They know it all. Nobody can tell them anything. Well, what idea is this, Mrs. Fenton? When she wanted to quit school and take the job in that drive-in restaurant, the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. But nobody could talk her out of it. Lord knows I tried. I knew something like this would happen. I just knew it. Yes, ma'am. Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to take her own life? Are you a policeman, too? Yes, ma'am. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. How do you do? How are you, ma'am? Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to kill herself? It's a little hard to say, Mr. Friday. What's that? Mona and I had quite an argument about her leaving school. It was one of those silly things that starts and gets all out of hand, you know. We both have pride, and neither one of us was going to back down. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen Mona to talk to for over a month. Does she live here, ma'am? Yes, she does, Mr. Smith. But there's an outside entrance to her room. She comes and goes as she pleases. Doesn't eat her meals here, so I hardly ever see her. Do mm -hmm. you know if she's been under a doctor's care? No, I don't think so. Why do you ask that? Well, is your daughter a diabetic? No, she isn't, Mr. Friday. Why all these questions about Mona and a doctor? What are you trying to find out? Does your daughter have any special boyfriends, Mrs. Fenton? She did have. Who was that? Richard Burdick, nice boy. Mona and he were planning to get married when they got out of school. Then, along with everything else, that just blew up. Everything seemed to go all at the same time. Did your daughter have any trouble with this verdict? No. Nothing you could call real trouble. It's just that they agreed to disagree. It was Mona's idea. Richard didn't want anything to change. He was very much in love with her. Uh-huh. Does he know about this? I don't think so, Miss Fenton. We haven't told him. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about it. It's going to hit him awfully hard. He's the sensitive type. Does your daughter have any close friends that she might confide in? I suppose she does. She's talked about some of the girls where she worked. Would you give us their names, please? Oh, well, yes, I will. I'll write them down for you, those I can remember. All right, fine. Has your daughter been in good spirits lately? As far as I know, yes. She's always seemed happy enough when I saw her. I told you we haven't said much more than hello the last month, but she seemed happy. Mm -hmm. You said that she broke up with this Burdick boy, is that right? Yes. But when was that? Six weeks, two months ago. You know what caused it? The job, all the other things. Mona kept making dates with him and then breaking them at the last minute. I guess Richard just got tired of being stood up. Well, did he and your daughter have any arguments that you know of? No. They just decided that it wouldn't work out for them. They just decided to stop seeing each other. Did your daughter have any other steady boyfriends? Anyone that she saw quite a bit of, maybe? Well, there was one boy. He was quite a bit older than Mona. She saw a lot of him the last couple of weeks. You know who he was? No, I never met him. I only saw him once. What if you could describe him for us? No, I'm afraid I can't. He drove by for Mona one night, going to pick her up for a date. Parked out in front and honked the horn. I see. I went to the front door to tell him to come in. Mona wasn't ready yet, but he wouldn't. Just sat out there and waited. I didn't get a good look at him. Could you describe the car for us? Not good. It was one of those foreign cars, a convertible. I think it might have been a Jaguar. I'm not sure about that, though. But you're sure it wasn't an American automobile? Yes, right? I'm sure about that. All right. How about the color of the car? Can you tell us that? It was awfully dark out there. I'm not sure. I'd rather not say, officer, if I can't be sure. You understand that. I wouldn't want to tell you something and then have it turn out to be wrong. You can understand that, can't you? Yes, ma'am, of course. Did you see Mona this morning? Yes, we did. Is she all right? They think so, yes. Aren't you sure? Well, when we talked to the doctor, they were doing everything they could. They seemed to think that she was going to be all right. Thank God. It's so hard, Mr. Friday, to know that your child is sick, that she tried to kill herself, to want to go to her and not be able to. It's so hard. <laughs> Try to take it easy if you can, Miss Fenton. If you'll just give us the names of the girls that she might know, we'll be on our way. Yes, I'll write them for you. Thank you. Excuse me? Shirley? 
Hello? Yes, it is. What? Yes, they're here. Just a moment. It's for you. I'll get it, Joe. I'll get those names for you, oh. Mr. Friday. All right, fine. Did your daughter ever refer to this man in the foreign car by name? No, well, I don't think she did. All I know is that whenever she went out with him, it was the big date of the bunch. How often did she see him? Maybe a couple of times a week. Might have been more. I had no way of knowing what she was doing. She kept pretty much to herself when she met him. But I could tell he was the big thing in her life. He was it. Joe? Yeah? Stay a minute. Yes, excuse me, Miss Finn. I'll finish this list. Thank you. Yeah. Call was from Jack Smyers at the office. Yeah. Just removed her to the general hospital. Yeah. She had a relapse. They don't think she's going to live. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two-way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. 45% of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over 10 years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for me, best for you. We obtained the name of the drive-in restaurant where the Fenton girl was employed. We also got the names of the girls that she worked with and the address of her boyfriend, Richard Burdick. Mrs. Fenton also gave us a list of names of persons who might be able to aid us in the investigation. Under further questioning, the mother was still unable to furnish us with a motive for her daughter's attempt to take her own life. The apparent lack of a motive or any type of a suicide note coupled with the bruise on the girl's chin made the likelihood of foul play more than possible. 12.57 p.m. We left the Fenton home and drove over to the drive-in. We stopped on the way and put in a call to the office. There still hadn't been any report of the handyman at the hotel, the only person who could give us a description of the man who'd registered at the place with the Fenton girl. When we got to the drive-in, we asked about a Peggy Griegson, one of the girls on the list. After a few minutes, the girl came over to our car. You want to see me? You Peggy Griegson? Yeah, why? We'd like to ask you some questions about Mona Fenton. Who are you guys? Police officers. We'd just like to talk to you. I gotta get it okayed with the manager. I'm on duty now, lunchtime. Pretty busy. I gotta get it okayed. I'll take care of it. All right, fine. I'll check with the manager, Joe. Right. Hope this isn't gonna take long. I got a couple of customers waiting for orders. My partner will take care of it. Why well, ain't the manager knowing that worries me? It's the tips they're gonna leave. You make what I do, and the tips are important. Yes, ma'am. It's all this about Mona, anyway. What are the cops after her for? Well, she tried to kill herself this morning. Mona? Yes. Why? Why'd you do a thing like that? Well, we thought maybe you could help us there. Why me? I haven't got anything to do with it. Well, we understand you're pretty friendly with her. Oh, well, sure, I was a friend of Mona's, but I don't know anything about no suicide. I don't know anything about it, and I don't want to. Do you know any reason she might try to take her own life? Not a reason in the world. Not Mona. Do you know if she was under a doctor's care for any reason? No. I mean, I don't know. She didn't say anything about it, never said a word. Was she? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. Can you think of any enemies she had? Anybody who might have wanted to hurt her? How far is this going to go? Well, how do you mean, miss? I mean, who's going to hear about this? Who's going to hear the answers I'm going to give you? Well, no one. Now, what do you got for us? Well, I'll give you this for free. If anything happened to Mona, you go talk to Dick Burdick. Talk to him. He'll be able to tell you. Why do you say that? Because it's true. No other reason. He's a real bum. You ask me, I think there's something wrong with him. You know, in the head. Would well, you have any reason to say that? All the reason in the world. Poor girl, this bum all the time coming around giving her trouble. All the time telling her how he's going to kill her and anybody that comes near her. Burdick said that to Miss Fenton, did he? Half a dozen times. It wasn't more than a week ago. Mona told me she told him off, told him to get lost. She wanted any part of him to leave her alone. He made a big scene. Mona told me all about it. One day, this Terry drove in here. Got one of those flashy foreign cars. A Jaguar? I think so, yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, one day, he drove into the place. Mona took care of him. I guess he liked Mona. He kept coming back, always parked in her station. 
Anyway, this Burdick kid found out about it. Wasn't anything for him to worry about, but he made a big thing about it. Mm-hmm. Told Mona she was supposed to stop seeing Terry. Said if she didn't, he was going to cause real trouble. Did he say what he was going to do? Oh, I think he was kidding. I don't think he really meant it. He's just a kid. Well, what did he say? I really don't think he meant it. Well, all right. Now, what did he say to her? He said if he found them together again, he'd kill them both. <laughs> We talked to the other girls in the drive-in. From them, we got the same story about the scenes that Richard Burdick had created. We got more information about the threats that he'd made against the Fenton girl and Terry Hamilton. From one of the girls, we got the address of Hamilton. 2.45 p.m. We left the drive-in and drove over to the address of the girl's boyfriend, Richard Burdick. We talked to the landlady. She told us that the Burdick boy had regular habits. He paid his rent on time. He never had any visitors. She told us that he wasn't in his room at that time, but she said that she'd let us in. In her company, we went upstairs. She unlocked the door, and Frank and I went in. Want well, to check the bedroom? I'll take the kitchen. Yeah. Well, there's nothing out there. How'd you do? Well, it looks like we're a little late. What? His clothes are gone. We checked the room further. Every indication was that Richard Burdick had left the apartment in a hurry. We talked to the landlady again. She could give us no reason for his disappearance. She gave us the name of his employer. We put in a call to them, but they told us that Bertie had failed to show up for work that day. 4.15 p.m. We put in a call to the hotel on Grand Avenue, but the handyman still hadn't returned and there'd been no word from him. We went back to the office and checked the name Richard Burdick through R&I, but we found no criminal record for anybody answering his description. We put out a local and an APB on him. At 4.39 p.m., we got a call from General Hospital telling us that the Fenton girl had regained consciousness and that we could talk to her. Frank and I left the office and traveled code two out to the hospital. The doctor on duty told us that the girl was out of danger, but that she was very weak. He asked us not to get her excited, and he led us into her room. Miss Fenton? Yes, who are you? Police officers. Why can't you leave me alone? Go away. Just a couple of questions we'd like to ask you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why, why didn't you leave things the way they were? Why didn't you leave me alone? Well, you had a lot of people worried, miss. No reason for it. Be better all the way around if things had happened the way I planned them. And you did try to kill yourself? Yes. Who was with you in that hotel room? You mean Mr. Morris? Yeah. It was Terry. It was always Terry. He was going to marry me, then he didn't. He said he would, and he didn't. That way you did what you did? Yes. You use narcotics, Miss Fenton? Hmm? You use narcotics? Yes, that was Terry's idea, too. I think that's all he wanted with me, just to get me hooked so I'd have to do what he said. I think that was the reason. How about this Richard Burdick? What about him? Do you have anything to do with you deciding to take your own life? In a lot of ways. The biggest mistake I ever made was leaving Richard. I thought it was smart, real smart. I was going to show him. Terry said he'd marry me, said he was in love with me. To get you started on narcotics? Yeah. At first, it wasn't so bad. I loved him, really, I did. Then when I had to have the fixes, he changed. He told me he couldn't give it to me anymore, that I was going to have to pay for it. I tried to tell him to tell him that I loved him, that I wanted to be with him. That's why I went to the hotel to talk it over, try to come to an understanding, some kind of an understanding. Mm-hmm. He said that he didn't want to have anything to do with me, that he wanted no part of me anymore said that I was going to have to pay for the H from now on. I didn't have any way to pay for it. He said it wasn't any of his business. Is he a user? Yes. It's all so stupid, all so stupid. Ma'am? The whole thing, I had it real good all the way around. And then I went ahead and ruined everything, tore it all down. Even if I'd have killed myself, it would have been no answer. Not the right answer, anyway. I know that. I know it real well. All right. Can you tell us where you can find this Terry? You bet I can. I want to see him feel like I do. I want him to know what it's like. Will you be willing to meet with him? Make a buy of narcotics for us? You name the time, I'll be there. I'll be there if I have to crawl. All right. You better get some rest now. I guess so. I'm pretty tired. Did you see my mother? Yes, ma'am. Is she real mad at me? No, I don't think she is. Would you call her? Ask her to come and see me? Tell her I'm sorry. Tell her I want to see her. 
Now, she'll be glad to hear that. I hope so. I got so much to tell her, her and Richard. So much to tell them both. All right, Miss Fenton. We'll get in touch with her. And you tell me when you want me to call Terry. You tell me. All right, we will. Terrible thing, isn't it? What's that? Terry. He's been around a long time. Must be other girls in the same fix all because of him. Girls who have a bad habit and have to do what he says. Girls like me, terrible. Nobody knows how many. Yes, ma'am. Where is it going to end? When you meet him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Veneman. Obviously, it would be impossible for you to question all the Chesterfield smokers that you'd run into, yet we're convinced that you want to know what effect a product has on people who do use it regularly. Well, Chesterfield tells you. Now, you've heard the report from the doctor who's been examining Chesterfield smokers. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. I think it would make good sense for you to change to Chesterfield today. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield's best for you. Terry Norris Hamilton was tried and convicted of violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, one count. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from one to five years. Mona Irene Fenton pled guilty to the same charge and was placed on probation for a period of three years with the provision that she be placed under the care of a competent psychiatrist. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Announcing the best of filter cigarettes, L&M filters. The L&M filter is entirely pure, harmless to health, filters out the heavy particles in the smoke, Gives you more flavor, less nicotine. L&M filters and Fatima with tips of perfect cork, both made and guaranteed by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Hear John Cameron Swayze and the news next on the NBC Radio Network.